Wow, one of us looks very professional. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, first time for us doing this, so we'll see how it goes. It'll be great. This will be, be a lovely thing. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. Welcome to Inside the Vault with Bank of Utah, where we discuss important topics and current events regarding banking and finance. Our goal is to be a resource for you to help you make well-informed decisions about managing your money. We hope you'll find this information beneficial. So let's get started. Let's open the vault to today's episode. I'm Brandon Hansen, president of Bank of Utah. And joining us today is renowned Bowtie economist, Dr. Elliot Eisenberg, chief economist for Lass and Graphs, to help us shed light on some looming questions facing business owners and individuals alike. Elliot is an internationally acclaimed economist and public speaker who focuses on making economics fun, relevant, and educational. He is also a past guest speaker of our Economic Outlook, joining us back in 2016. Elliot, it's great to have you with us again. Thank you for the invitation, Brandon. It's great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let's jump right in. So, Elliot, we're at a fascinating yet perplexing point in economic history when it comes to national debt and how that debt impacts interest rates. To put it into perspective, over the next 12 months, over $9 trillion of U.S. government debt will mature. That amount represents about a third of all of our outstanding debt. Traditional buyers of that debt have been China, the Fed itself through quantitative easing, and then of course the, the banking system. The banks are grappling with liquidity issues, China's scaling down, and the Fed of course is not easing at this point. What do you think is going to happen with interest rates this next year? And the Fed's uh, also continuing to reduce their balance sheet with quantitative uh, uh, tightening. So it's an, another source of supply, not demand for, for, for assets. You know, I, I'm a little concerned about that. That's not the primary driver of my fears, but it's it's certainly part of the story. There's no question. The government should have issued longer term debt somewhere along the way and in, 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 increased the duration of our of our debt uh, to be more resistant from rate rate fluctuations. But they took the easy way out, took the low rates that were available at the time, and now we're paying the price. So this will probably cause rates to rise 20, 30 basis points, probably, which all else equal is not a great thing. And, and there's no prospect of China coming back and suddenly becoming a big buyer or Japan. They're also a large, they each hold over a trillion dollars in, 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 in treasuries out there. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, very interesting to see how that plays out. Sort of related to this question, there's been a lot of discussion about the Fed cutting interest rates, maybe as early as March this year. We've got incredibly low unemployment rates. We've got inflation that's still well over 2%. You know, how realistic is it uh, to expect that the Fed's going to cut rates this year? Uh, I think you lead into the question with the, with, the, with, the, with the right thought process. I'd be very surprised. Their next meeting, April's too early, May, they meet every six weeks, maybe May, certainly by June. I think we need to see inflation fall another half a point, roughly. And then the Fed will be happy. Remember, the Fed doesn't look at CPI. The Fed looks at something called PCE. It's a little different measure. And the core measure there, which excludes food and energy, is now in the low threes. If it cracks three or gets into the high twos, two nine, I think that's the, the telltale sign that they'll start to lower rates. But until then, they'll be reluctant. Remember, they were late to raise rates in the first place, which exacerbated the inflation that we experienced in 21 and 22. So they're not going to be early to cut rates. This Fed has been, how should I say it? a consistent disappointment to markets. Markets have thought the Fed would raise less, they raise more. They keep rates higher for shorter, now they're keeping rates higher for longer. They're gonna raise rates quickly? No, they're not gonna raise rates quickly. I'd be very surprised if this Fed suddenly changed its spots and did what markets expected and it behaves as dovishly as markets expect. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that the Fed was slow to increase interest rates. I think we were all noticing that to be the case. I heard an interesting antidote as to why that was the situation that evolved. Jay Powell was currently in the process of being reappointed as the Fed governor. Of course, he was appointed by uh, President Trump. And now you have the Biden administration in place. 
And I think there were those that were concerned that if the Fed was too aggressive or hawkish about increasing interest rates, then maybe Jay Powell would not be reelected to Fed governor. And so I had heard rumors that was the reason for the stall. And of course, the Fed's not supposed to be political, but very apparently we can see that it could be. I think the answer is yes and yes. They're not supposed to be political, but like everybody else, they're influenced by it. The other thing that I heard at the time that was more economic in nature, and I, you know, what do we know? We're on the outside, right? was that unemployment, that they feared that unemployment would come down much more slowly than it would, than it did. And therefore, they were very reluctant. They didn't even begin quantitative tightening until March of 22 when they began raising rates. They could have certainly done that earlier, six months earlier, without causing massive discombobulation of markets, but they didn't. And yeah, you may well be 100% right. I, no one knows. Well, I definitely would not want to have Fed uh, Chair Jay Powell's uh, job at this point. Of course, you've got the fiscal side of things being very uh, stimulative, even to this day. And then, of course, the, on the monetary policy side, trying to rein things back in to fight inflation. So interesting situation for sure. Well, uh, let's talk about the stock market a little bit. Uh, we talked a little bit about politics. Uh, this year's an election year. You know, I hear a lot of people say that in an election year, it's a great time to buy stocks because the stock market goes up during an election year. Is there any truth to this idea? Yeah, there's been all kinds of historical data on business cycles and election cycles and so on and so forth. And whatever happens in January determines or sell in May and go away. All these rules of thumb and so on. And they all have some historical, clearly some interesting factors. But I think the most important thing that's going on right now in the stock market, two things are happening. One is I think it's priced. I'm not a stock market expert here, right? Like I am macroeconomy. I follow that more closely. But the market seems to be priced pretty much for perfection, I think. P.E. ratios are high. Cyclically adjusted P.E. ratios are high. Uh, the, the, the premium between the Treasury and the market's not that high that it, like, it, like it has historically been. I'm a little nervous, I, I think would be the best way to put it, and the stock markets. As for the election, the fact that the two candidates are close. Yeah, the election numbers say that if the election were held today, President Trump would win, but we're still 10 months away or whatever it is from the election. That's a long time. If it stays close and there's no clear winner, like a you know an overwhelming guaranteed winner, a lot of firms I bet are likely to say to hold back and go, I don't want to invest. So this may act as a mild, I would expect a mild drag the longer we go and if, if it stays close. If one suddenly leaps out and gets a nice edge, then investors know what's going to happen and we'll, we'll do this or we'll do that if Democrats or Republicans or whatever. But the uncertainty slows things down. Yeah, I think it's also important to point out that a lot of the gains in the equity markets have been sort of uh, outperforming by this magnificent seven, right? These... Uh, these seven large companies that tend to be driving the index to higher returns. And a lot of the smaller companies maybe aren't doing as well in, in the equity side of things. Right. So we'd like to see the stock market bulls certainly want to see some breadth in the number of companies participating in the, the, up, the updraft. Yeah. Well, hey, next question. I know this is an area of interest for you, but, uh, but let's dig a little deeper into the long-term effects of regulation. You know, the United States boasts a history of free market capitalism, but obviously over the years, government regulations have increasingly entered into the marketplace. Can you give us some examples of some well-intended regulation that maybe has led us down the road to some unintended consequences? I think the, the biggest example, I mean, there are many, right? I mean, it's hard to say the biggest, but one of the big ones is housing. People buy a house. They want to keep their house, their neighborhood pretty. They want to keep it the way it was when they moved in. And they elect local city councilors or selectmen or county commissioners or whatever it is to protect neighborhoods. But that goes on across all 3,800 counties or whatever there are and hundreds of thousands of cities and towns and villages. And as a result, we don't build enough homes. We're chronically short housing. And this is causing a lot, a big problem. People can't move where the jobs are. So you live here, but there are no jobs, but you can move there where there are a lot of jobs, but there are no houses or housing is twice as expensive there. And you say, no, I'll just stay here and try and eke out a living. This is a really big problem. So the idea of protecting houses, keeping neighborhoods pretty, roads narrow, and so on, leads to a large macroeconomic problem. People say to me, well, house prices are so high, shouldn't builders build more homes? Well, yeah, they should, but they can't. If they could, they would. And this is the problem. You pass the regulatory stuff, it solves one problem, but it almost inevitably it creates another problem that's out there that may be as bad, worse, whatever. It's, it's hard to tell from time to time. 
I'll give you another weird example that's just brand new. This isn't a government regulation. This is sort of a private sector one. Schools in during COVID decided not to have students, ap applicants, high school seniors, give SAT scores. They said, well, it's hard, COVID, room, you know, full of people, you'll get sick. No, 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 no SAT scores. And the thinking was, oh, many schools no longer require them. They thought this would be a, a help to low-income students and students, minority students. The, the, the upper-income students wouldn't have another, another advantage. The data turned out to be completely the opposite. And the SAT tests were found out to be one of the least biased indicators out there. And this is now harming lower-income students. So the best of intentions so often lead to lousy outcomes. Yeah, that's very interesting. And especially on the, the home price situation, something that's kind of affecting all of us right now. Here in the state of Utah, Governor Cox launched an initiative this year to build 35,000 starter homes over the next five years. I'm not sure how they're defining starter home and how they're going to get those homes built over the next five years. But that's one of the ways they're trying to address the problems here. But again, there'll probably be some other unintended consequence from that, right? It would be a great thing for the state. I mean, Utah has terrific population growth, and you don't want to become like your state to the east, Colorado, where in Denver, the average home price for 2023 in Denver, so it's the front range, it's, it's the more expensive city in the, in the state, of course, is $790,000. I mean, the movement into Colorado has gone way down as prices have gone way up. Forget about California, where they're losing population. In Utah, you want to stay vibrant, young, and affordable. And the, the, one of the keys is to build houses. Build, build, build. Awesome. We really appreciate your insights. They're very enlightening. Appreciate you sharing your perspective with our listeners. We're eagerly anticipating your visit to Utah. Will you be speaking at our economic event? That's going to be held February 6th to the 8th. Yes and yes. This is Elliot Eisenberg cordially inviting you to attend one of the presentations I'll be making for the Bank of Utah somewhere between Feb 6 and Feb 8. There'll be a number of cities and a number of places. I very much look forward to sharing my thoughts with you and very much hope that you can attend. You'll see me, you'll see your friends, you'll do some networking. It'll be a lovely time. Please come. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this episode of Inside the Vault with Bank of Utah. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore, please send them our way. And be sure to visit our website for more exclusive content and follow us on social media. That's it for now. Until next time on Inside the Vault with Bank of Utah.